So our next speaker is a zoologist specialising in animal behaviour. He's been involved in the animal protection field for over 20 years and is a company consultant for the Animal Protection Consultancy. Um, he was born, probably raised in Catalan in Spain, involved in the anti war fighting movement, about which he's going to be talking about worldwide anti war fighting movement just a second or two. Uh, please put your hands together for Geordie Kazamik Jara. Thank you very much. Well, first, first of all, I would like to apologize because you will notice I have a funny accent. And I also not just that, I speak very fast and I accelerate through the process of talking. So it will be a moment you might think what, what he's talking about. But I promise you in a couple of minutes you'll get completely used to it and ignore your brain will learn that I speak English unless, unless something strong something happened to me in the process. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about the international anti war fighting movement. This is going to be a positive talk. I, I have given several talks about this subject in the past. Often they are very depressive. Most often I have to explain people what it's all fighting about, and that's a terrible thing to have to explain because people end up depressed, crying often because the images are terrible. It's such an outrageous thing. But I know all of you know about it. You, you might have seen this leaflet I've been putting around. If you want to know more details about the weapons that are used to torture the bulls, the leaflet is over there. You can pick it up. Or you can ask me afterwards. This, this talk is not going to be about that. It's not going to be about how terrible whole things and bulls, bulls vomiting blood and all this sort of thing. This is a positive talk. It's about how much we have advanced <coughs> in stopping bullfighting. And we have. So this is about the, uh, the movement, the social movement, the anti bullfighting movement, composed by people of all ages, genders, religions, countries. And it's an international movement. It has been more international in the last. 10, 15 years than ever, so it has become really a big thing, which explains why we have achieved quite a few things during these years, and that's what we'll, we'll be talking about. But first of all, let's, get, uh, let's start with the definition of bullfighting, so you all know what I'm talking about. That's the best definition I, uh, I can use and I'd like to use. It's any activity in which cattle, mainly bulls, sometimes cows, but mainly bulls, are stressed, exhausted, injured, and or killed for sport, entertainment, or celebration. The N O here is quite important because although often you see these four yellow adjectives in, in any bullfight, you see bulls killed after they've been injured, after they've been exhausted, after they've been stressed. Uh, you don't need to get these four things to be considered bullfighting. Sometimes some bullfights don't kill the bull again, others they don't injure it, but they're always exhausted and stressed because otherwise people would not get uh, close enough to them. So it's always one of these four. As long as it's one of these four, that's probably bullfighting. And it's not to be confused with bulls fighting other bulls or cows fighting other cows, which is organized in some other countries. We call that fighting bulls, fighting cows. Bullfighting is when people fight bulls. In any of the stores and forms, you can see in these pictures with ropes, with on horses, on mats, on groups, etc. Not jumping on top of them or striking them things all together. That's what bullfighting we consider that all types of bullfighting should be abolished. In the there are many types, there are many styles. This, what we call bullfighting proper, is the bullfighting that occurs in bull rings, in specific places, by people that are specially trained to fight bull, called bulls bullfighters. Uh, because there are other types, which are the bullfights where occur in the streets by the general public that doesn't really know how to fight. This, we call that fiestas with bulls. The bullfighting proper does occur in bull rings. And there are several styles depending on where you go. I'm not going to explain in detail what they they are, but you can see basically there are three main styles, a variant style, French, and North American style that started not that long ago, about 30 years ago. And the most well-known um, style is the Spanish style, the, the classic Spanish style, which is one you probably know, which is thought to represent. This is the one where they have a bullfighter on foot with a red cape facing a bull, but that photo only occurs when previously other things have happened. Previously, some of the bullfighters on horse will have start the bull, the bull on the back in order to make it lose blood and produce pain. After that, you know, it comes with um, sticks. And you see all these uh, weapons here in this little Sticks are called banderillas, and these types called banderillas, banderillero. They have uh, harpoons in the end, so they got stuck. And they don't fall, and that produces pain and more blood loss. And only when the bull is completely debilitated, that is when the bullfighter comes with a sword and kills the bull. And that's the one we know. 
if it, the whole process happens exactly the same thing, but the whole fight is on horse, we call that rejoneo, which is another style in Spain. In Portugal, it's very similar, but the emphasis is in the, on the horseman, more normally the main fight is on the horseman. And they don't kill the bull in the arena, but they kill it outside. And that's also a misconception. People think that they don't kill it. They do. They kill it exactly the same thing. It's actually even worse in Portugal and other places because uh, the torture is the same, the same boundary, the same process. But the bull, instead of being killed straight away, which the whole torture might last 20 minutes, they might kill it two or three days afterwards. Because in Portugal, often bull fights occur on a Friday rather than on a Saturday. And they wait until Monday, so the other 12 world comes and they kill the bull then. So you might spend a couple of days bleeding, no food, no water there, waiting for the, other, for the final coup de grace, which means it could be actually could be considered worse in the case of Portugal. In France, they also use other styles. The course can, I guess, go around this in the south of France, but also they use the Spanish style. In North America, they have a variation of the Portuguese style where they don't injure the bull on the ferry, but they, the investigations undercover have shown that they actually do injure it. What is it practiced? Which countries are we talking about? Well, sometimes in countries they occur occasionally, but these are the countries where there is a bullfighting industry. So they, they have bull rings, they have bullfighting schools, they have bullfighting bull farms. We have three in Europe, Spain, Portugal, and France. Spain happens more or less everywhere, but much more in the south and in the north. In the south and in the center, in the north almost there's no bullfighting going on. In Portugal, it happened more or less everywhere, a little bit more in the south as well, because of the influence of Spain too. And in France, it only happens in the south. It's actually illegal, bullfighting in the rest of the country. And it happens in the south, the Spanish style equally, so depending on the country you look, the Spanish will be, the style will be different. Of course, countries that have a Spanish origin, uh, in terms of they belonged to the Spanish empire, when there was an empire, they tend to have the Spanish style, obviously they will have other style. You see in America, we have America, we have Mexico, Venezuela, Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, and the United States. You see that not all Latin American countries have bullfighting anymore, although they used to have them. You see, you don't see Argentina, or Chile, or Uruguay, or Bolivia here, so just few of them. Nowadays, the most bullfighting country in the world is not Spain anymore, it's Mexico. It's the country where you have more bullfights, and more suffering, and, and it's more difficult to stop it. So Spain is not anymore the, the the major bullfighting country in the world. So this is basically the map of the bullfighting industry. This is an industry, it's a profit-making industry. They just operate to get money. Uh, because they have a, uh, bull rings in different hemispheres, normally the bullfighters in Europe, when they end the, se the session, you know, the, the season, which is a seasonal event, only in when the weather is good in summer and spring, when summer ends, they will move to South America and continue killing bulls in South America. So they, it's the same bullfighters you'll find both in Europe and America, they just spent whole day, whole year killing animals in different places. And you might find the same bullfighting promoter in different countries, or even the owners of, one bull, of a bull ring might be the owners of another bull ring in another country. It's really a multinational industry. And therefore, it needs to be faced by a multinational uh, movement, so an international movement, like the anti bullfighting. But let me give you a bit of a historical precedent, so to speak, to show you how much opposition has been against bullfighting since the very beginning. The origins of bullfighting are diverse. No, no, nobody really agrees exactly how it started, because many countries many years ago did similar things and rituals related to attacking bulls in one way or another. But it's only about when we are talking about the 15th century, when we already find uh, countries that have established something clearly that we can call bullfighting, some ritual, it's not a ritual anymore, it's very structured, there's some rules, there's some ways of doing this. And, and countries that were at that time, in the 15th century, already known to be bull, bullfighting countries, compared with others that they might have some activity. And there is one, definitely one country that was the most bullfighting country in the world at the time, the 15th century. I wonder if any of you know which country we're talking about. Do, do any of you know? Not the UK, because the UK didn't exist at the time. It was England. It was indeed the UK, or the equivalent of the UK at the time. England was the, country, the most bullfighting country in the world. Of course, they, they didn't use the term bullfighting, they used the term bull baiting. Because the weapon used, instead of being a metal sword, was a dog. The UK was very good at the time to transform animals into weapons. Dogs for fighting, dogs for war, dogs for sport. 
That's the first time that bullfighting is associated with a sport. You know the concept of cruel sports, it's a very British concept, but that's how it started too. Not just bull baiting, bear baiting, badger baiting, and all the baiting, so you know. So well, Britain is very much responsible for the creation of bullfighting, so that's why we feel that Britain has to be also very much involved in the evolution of bullfighting, because there's some inheritance there. But from the very beginning, the bullfighting was established as some sort of physical known activity with a name and some official support it. At the same time, people started to organize against it. That was immediately. To the point that this thing happened, the Pope Pius V in 1567, a long time ago, banned bullfighting uh, because he found, found it was terribly cruel, not just for human, for people, also for human, uh, for animals, also for humans. And not just ban it, make it a sin, a mortal sin. So in theory, if you're Catholic and you go to a bullfight, not just participate in one, if you go to a bullfight, you're going to burn in hell forever because it's a mortal sin. And, uh, and that interesting thing is uh, following popes ignore that law, that canonic law, which has, has created a very strange uh, canonic controversy because in theory a pope is infallible because it talks directly to God or God talks to him. Uh, and then apparently no, no pope could be wrong. And then suddenly you have two different popes saying one is in sin, the other is not. So it's still a question. You still see in Catholic countries in anti bull fighting uh, demonstrations of sad bull rings, placards mentioning part of the feast and saying, Remember Pi the Fifth. And some very devout Catholics sometimes think twice and you see people turning and going back home just in case. That's that's true. <laughs> so still there, but what happens in the UK at the time, or in England at the time, you might remember a few decades before that, the king said, I don't care about the Pope. And because Henry VIII says we're gonna split from the Pope, uh, uh bullfighting continued there without any 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 change. So the seventeenth century also England was the main bullfighting country in the world. It was so successful. I did that even the one, hundred, one century afterwards, still the UK was the most providing uh, country in the world. So you see, many centuries, because it evolved in different uh, forms. Happily, in the 18th century, something happened in the world, what we know as the Enlightenment. And the movement, this, this intellectual movement, started to change their approach about things. And many countries started to take it, starting with intellectuals and artists, and it moved into politics. And many countries started to ban activities that before were accepted. So it was a movement that was saying tradition and superstition is less important than rationalization and common sense. Of course, that implied many of the time uh, that laws were created to stop activities like that. Unfortunately, that's the sad case, the alignment never worked in Spain. Worked in many countries, but never worked in Spain. Although there were intellectuals in the Spanish uh, culture that were a part of the movement, the politicians never got it, so they got it in other countries, but not in Spain. So at the time, when we had bullfighters of different types everywhere in the world, and England was the top one, then because of the alignment, England started to lose interest, and then suddenly that Spanish style that was there for a few years, but uh, flourished. And then we have really the creation of the modern style of bullfighting in Andalusia, in the south of Spain, in the city of Ronda, which, because in the other countries that had been in decline, in Ronda they mixed two styles, one from the aristocracy that was mainly on horse, with one from lower classes that was on food, put it together, created much more stylized art with three acts and very much, very much ritualized, and created the modern concept of bullfighting that we know. And of course, that was also the time that Gibraltar became British, and many Britons that uh, still liked to see bulls being tortured, then in the way to, to Gibraltar, through land, they saw all these other styles and they started to get interested and pay money to watch it. The first time that bullfighting became a business, up to then, was just an event or social event. So the British tourists going to Gibraltar also are responsible to make bullfighting a business, not just making it a sport, also making it a business. See how much we are responsible for this. And I say we because I consider myself British now. Uh, in the same way that Britain was responsible for slavery, and at the same time was responsible for abolishing slavery, the same thing happened here. So uh, in Britain, after the Enlightenment, there was the creation of proper organized animal protection movements. As you know, in London, 1884, the RSPCA was created as the first well-organized animal protection organization. It didn't take that long to create the Cruelty to of, of Animals Act in 1835, where bullfighting was banned, and cock fighting, and dog fighting, and all the fightings with animals. Uh, again, that's a good signal, and of course, other countries started to imitate, and Holland also did it, and other countries started to do it. So Spain didn't have the privilege to have the political class already sensible to the environment, so they didn't 
have that, but in some regions of Spain at the time, Catalonia is one of them, they had gone through a process very similar to Britain at the time, because as you know, at that time we had the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in Britain, and in Catalonia that was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in Spain as well. And there were similarities in, in, in approaches that made Catalans start to organize against bullfighting already in 1926, 26, which is this is a picture, it's a picture in Barcelona of an anti fighting meeting of people getting together trying to see how we can stop, considering that they had no politicians in their side at the time and just trying to get inspired with the successes of other countries. As you see, opposition to bullfighting really is quite old, it's not just a few years back, we're talking about a long time ago. This is the past. So, what's the present? Well, the present is that bullfighting has become, the anti fighting movement has become very international. And it's a, it's a social movement, and as a sole social movement, also a social movement, kind of follows a profile like this. This is a kind of a pyramid shape that kind of represents what all social movements are. They always have a big, big base of sympathizers, people that agree with you, then uh, grassroots uh, activities, so groups that work locally above them. Some of them are better organized, they work nationally or work regionally, like core organizations. Some of them, of them, they might have bullfighting in this case as their core campaigns, the only campaign, perhaps, or one of the most important campaigns. We call these core groups. Some of these, they might be very successful when they do, and then we call these top groups. And some might be at the avant-garde of the movement because they are inspirational, because they have developed new techniques or tactics that have worked, and these are called key groups. In the anti fighting movement, that's how it works about sympathizers. We have about 20 countries in the world where there is some sort of anti fighting campaign going on. Either particular organizations that are the main subject or as part of the normal campaigning, there is some information going from animal protection to the general public who then responds saying, I don't want to fight. Then we have, well, these are the countries I'm talking about. So mainly in Europe that don't have bullfighting at the moment, like Italy, Germany, Switzerland, etc. But of course, all bullfighting countries they still they have a strong anti fighting position too. And then we have the grassroots groups. We calculate as a pure estimation, there's about 1,000 grassroots small groups everywhere in the world that they're doing campaigning locally. Some of these, uh, they're better organized, they're doing more regionally or, na or nationally, and we calculate there's about 150 organizations that are very much the core of the bullfight, the anti bullfighting movement. And up to 15 years ago or so, they would be operating in their own territory. But very recently, especially in the last 10 years, they're starting to really work together, one with the other, from different countries. Uh, and we created what we call the World Network for the Abolition of Bullfighting. That more or less covers half of those 150s, because the net this network has some rules, and, uh, and not all the uh, organizations might adhere to these rules. For instance, these are completely abolitionist network, so we don't accept any type of bullfighting, even those where supposedly the bull is not killed or not injured, we're still <coughs> completely uh, campaigning for the abolition of those two. Or we are not violent at all, we don't accept any violent type of campaign. So because we have some rules, not everybody has joined this network, but half of these 150 have. So we have a, a huge representation, representation of people from everywhere. These are kind of the current, well, it's probably, probably it's all already, it's about a year old uh, profile of, of, in countries of this network, you see. Spain has 18 groups, Colombia 10, with seven groups from the United Kingdom. The most well known is FAS, Fight Against Animal Cruelty in Europe. You probably have heard about it. Uh, Tony Moore and Vicky Moore. Vicky Moore died tragically because of a uh, bull who attacked her in, during her campaign two years back. Now Tony Moore is continuing operating this organization that from the north. We also have the League High School Sports that joining the movement uh, in 2006. I used to work for the League at the time, and I, I promoted that campaign, and I'm, I'm glad to see that still all fighting is one of the campaigns of the League, and other, other, other organizations from the UK. And you see all the countries that have all fighting have representation there, and countries that don't have all fighting as well, like Netherlands, or Switzerland, or Ireland, or the United States, or the United States does have all fighting. Uh, we don't only get together uh, through email or electronically, as you can do these days. Uh, but we also meet once a year in different countries, in different countries, in what we call the Intercontinental Anti-Bullfighting anti Summit. So normally the representatives of the 
most active organizations meet once a year, not necessarily all the same every year, so we always try to get more people in. And that's a very good um, method to get everybody to know each other, to interchange tactics. We, it's a secret meeting, we don't tell anyone. We choose a country, we meet and tell everyone. Once we die, then we tell everyone. Because, of course, it's quite dangerous, because the fighting industry is as dangerous as could be the hunting fraternity. And it's dangerous to have all the top guys in the same place. Uh, but we, it's a very good thing to do, to meet, and these are, so I'm going to show you some of the pictures of the meetings. This is the first one we did in, in Lisbon a few years back in 2006. Then we have the next one in Brussels. Uh, you see kind of people of all sizes and colors uh, as they flex. Uh, this one was in Caracas the following year in Venezuela. This one in Barcelona. Yeah. After that, this one here was in Mexico City, which happened about 10 years ago, uh, 10 days ago, so it was there. Uh, and as you see, it's people from all countries and all trying to share their, their uh, strategies, and it's a very good way also to imitate what, everything that has worked in the country. And that's how we made the, the whole campaign more international. Of course, from all these 150 groups, there will be always some that are really doing more, because they have resources to do so, because they have more emphasis in their campaign to do so. And in the last, I would say, five years, it, this will be the kind of organizations that are this, belong to these 20 groups. And all types of organizations, that's an interesting thing. You'll see animal rights organizations, animal welfare organizations from all different countries. We have uh, the crack French and the flat French. We have the legal and that, because started to get very much involved. The Swiss Crime Weber Foundation, the CAS International, which is the biggest anti war fighting organization that only works on anti war fighting. They are Dutch. And after working for the Legal Export Force, I moved and I worked for CAS International. Animal, which are Portuguese, animal naturalists everywhere in Latin America, Amelia from Mexico, Ada, Spain, like Ecuador Animal, or Alterigo Oliver, or Fada, Peter Whisper, the American Human Society, etc. This is all types of organizations. Uh, if you have to select from these which are the top ones, the ones that have achieved more in, in, the, in these few years, and the ones that have been inspiring more the others in leading been the engines of the movement. Uh, I would say that, that probably these are the ones that fit the profile, though these might change every year and they might change every period. So the crack reference is the most important French ones and we have some play much more an active role on the ground, others play much more a role financially or also with logistical support. And if you have to pick up three groups, I would say that they have been on the press all the time, and they are high, they are really very important, I would say, in the last few years, couple of years. Libera, Ecolimale, and Animal Trial has really been ahead, but they never manage to do things by themselves, and then what you often see is this tandem situation. You see one country, one organization in that country doing a little more, because has developed a partnership with another organization of another country that normally plays much more a financial support role or a logistical role. So we have the Swiss Frank Weber supporting the Catalan Libera, or the Dutch CAR supporting the Spanish Equanimal, or Peter supporting Animal Naturalis. So you see this tandem situation all the time. This is why these three groups have achieved quite a lot in the last few years. But if I had to reanalyze the whole thing now, starting 2011, in the next few years, I already start to see newcomers and people that are playing this role. So now we have the uh, Mexicans in, um, in Amedea that have achieved quite a lot in the last few months with the support of the Korean Society International they, from the United States. Suddenly they are there. And then we have the Equatorians from PAI, uh, PAI Protection Animal Ecuador, that with the help, with the help of the, the Swiss French Weber Foundation have achieved quite a lot in a few, a few months. So this top always changes because every time that something happens in a country, suddenly that becomes in the news and in, it's an important news everywhere. And of course, the relationships with all these groups do change. They develop a new relationship even then. They fight against each other and they split and they uh, reconciliate and bigger coalitions are created or smaller coalitions. It's a very dynamic, but uh, we work all together. We have this norm in the network that we don't talk about anything other than bullfighting. So you don't talk about vegan or vegetarian. We don't talk about any animal welfare issue or animal rights issue. So we know, we accept, we tolerate our differences. But we know that we all want the abolition of bullfighting. And that's how we manage to make the whole thing work. Which activities have happened, have occurred during all this time? Well, the classical activities that you can see in any uh, animal protection movement, uh, press conference, you can see everywhere, direct actions in on objects that have a symbol and representing bullfighting, the classic 
uh, tables to inform the people or letter writing or signature gathering. Some of the less common things that you see, uh, such as education in the schools, many groups that go to schools to teach children to be handicapped fighting, or uh, plays, theatre plays, or street performing. There's a lot going on in anti fighting campaign in this aspect. And concepts, there is a very strong link between the urban cultures and being anti fighting. Many urban tribes tend to define themselves as anti fighting in many countries, so they will have always a music that defines the culture, and the, the subculture, and they would often have rock bands that have anti fighting songs, and there are concerts that are organized just to, to, to raise support against bullfighting and in favor of the anti fighting organizations. We also have the uh, Peter style uh, publicity stunt, uh, stunts with a lot of flash exposure, and uh, then we have the Greenpeace style publicity stunts with a lot of banners hanging in prominent places, like in this case Rio de Janeiro. So we have all sort of uh, activities related to animal protection that have been incorporated in, into the movement. Of course, the most traditional uh, form of protest would be the demonstration, and because bullfights occur in a particular place in the bullring in a particular time, it's very easy to focus the energy in the demonstration. But uh, uh, here it's relatively easy to demonstrate, but in many countries that often is quite difficult, and demonstrations more often than not end up with the police and gas and everything and the rest. And, and uh, so it's a tough thing to do for anti fighting movement to have to demonstrate in there, because they, of course the bullfighters also know where they're going to be, and also they are become the target of them. The arrested, etc. Uh, some demonstrations have become really very big. This is in Barcelona. Thousands of people demonstrated against bullfighting a few years before we achieved the ban in Catalonia. And this one was relatively uh, uh, soon, uh, or a bit close to us, which was, I think, last year or the year before, in Madrid as well. A lot of support. You see, they become sometimes massive. But what has happened is the emphasis in, in demonstration has been. Uh, kind of uh, uh, diminishing in a way in favor of much more media oriented activities, like publicity stunt properly, uh, like these ones in France. <coughs> this particular one, also very much based on Peter Star campaigning in Spain as well, with trying to show uh, the, the realities of bullfighting in a much more stylized and image conscious way. All this one in Paris. It's all about the photo and, and the, the newspaper. And, and getting quite sophisticated. Uh, like this one, if you go to the next step, you get all these people not just sitting there, also all of them uh, uh, portraying themselves as the image of a bull being suffering that was in Pamplona uh, the, a couple of years ago, where the rhyme of the bulls occurred. And this was in the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, in the Basque country, which of course shows a higher level of organization, a higher level of economic support as well, that the movement is getting more sophisticated in all its performance and also more media oriented, which explains why we get we can reach in quite far. Uh, beyond this, we have lobby, and lobby occurs at different levels, local or regional, and also European uh, level. This is in Brussels, in the European Parliament, a campaign that we did a few years back uh, that we called for a more fighting free Europe, in which we had a White bull, uh, and we asked MEPs to sign the bull if they were against bullfighting, and many, many did. And at the same time, we organized a seminar of anti bullfighting experts of all sorts and politicians explaining how bullfighting should be banned and subsidies should stop. You might recognize Caroline Lucas at the, the middle of it, the, the MP, which at the time was the MEP for the Green Party, and she always been very active against uh, bullfighting, and that's the proof. And also, at the same time that was going on, we had publicity stands outside with this Stop Our Shame platform that was created for the occasion from people from everywhere. So we have people from all the countries in the world, this emphasis in being international, protesting and asking Europe to sort out the situation. And then, of course, the next level, uh, this is what is a lobbying, top lobbying level, if you go to the grassroots activities, they never ceased, it's always been activities such as the saboteur type of activity, the equivalent of a hand saboteur in the hunting debate occurs in the bullfighting saboteur in the bullfighting debate. Bullfight uh, campaigners jumping on bull rings, which is quite an interesting thing to do with placards and making the point, and often uh, they are removed. It was in Spain a couple of years back. They started to do it in France a few years back, and it was quite a few years back, but the last one was quite spectacular, this one. In, in France, about uh, say a month ago, 
they managed to have to, to change themselves in the middle and stay there for more than half an hour. Uh, and all the public jumped into the arena and attacked them and injured them, and they never reacted. So, like completely Gandhi-style type of peaceful and non-violent protest. And these were Belgians in France, so it became an international incident because the police did nothing, and then the Belgian politicians complained to the French, and Sarkozy was completely out. Uh, but by surprise, and that's how we do it. We, we, inter we put people from different countries, and then events become international things. Then I thought another level, we became more sophisticated type of campaigning, like adverts on, on papers. This is an advert organized or created by Whisper in conjunction with Ada. This, if those images of the, of the uh, 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 pyramid I showed before had been made a few years back, you would have seen Ada uh, as one of the main organizations supported by Whisper. A few years back, they did a lot of things, and they did this advert. And of course, you have the classic. Peter, uh, Arthur, that you often see everywhere, with celebrities' involvement against, against wolf fighting. Uh, and that goes into also symposiums of experts and scientists that get together and talk about wolf fighting and justify it, uh, or justify the campaign against it in different places, places in the world. Even that was a very interesting international thing to do. Uh, in G Geneva, there was a trial against the presidents of the countries where wolf fighting is allowed in Europe. It was a mock trial, but it was exactly like a trial with the jury and witnesses. I was one of the expert witnesses. And all the presidents, you see the photos of the presidents there, of the European countries they have wolf fighting, they were accused, and there was deliberation that they were found guilty, and a letter was sent to them, and you've been found guilty of uh, having allowed wolf fighting in your country. It became a very publicity oriented event. That's what has been done. What have we achieved? Well, we achieved many things in all these years. I'm to go fast. Change the population perception of bullfighting. Uh, we already changed completely the mind of people in bullfighting countries. 72% of people in Spain are not interested, in France, 83% against it, Portugal, 75%. In each country, there is bullfighting already. The majority of the people don't want it, or if, they have, if you ask young people in particular, they all want it banned. We also have banned bullfighting in countries, such as the UK, but also in Italy, Netherlands, Germany, in, and bullfighting countries like Argentina, Cuba, Chile, Uruguay. Argentina was one of the first things that banned when it became independent, Cuba, quite, in, with the revolution. Or we banned the entrance of minors in, bullf in, in bullfights. Catalonia started doing this in the 80s, managed to get a law to ban the entrance of minors in Catalonia or quite a long time ago back, but Ecuador managed to get it a, few years, a couple of years back. Banning of uh, broadcasting bullfights before the watershed was achieved in Ecuador quite recently. Stopping the broadcasting bullfighters in National TV was achieved in Spain recently, although now the Spanish government has changed, it's become right wing, and now they say they want to put it back. Uh, we have the banning of the construction of new bull rings. Catalonia also created a law a few weeks back to ban the construction of new bull rings, which helped to change the perceptions. Or banning organizing bull rings in areas that they had no tradition before, which is France is the case. You cannot organize bullfight in, uh, in areas where they had no tradition before. Catalonia also managed to do that. Exop stop tax exemptions of bullfight industry has in some countries. Peru managed to do that a few years back. Closing uh, bull rings for lack of standards. This is perhaps one of the most satisfying things. Uh, anyway, when you have pictures like these, when you have a bulldozer demolishing a bullfight, a bull ring, that's for a bullfight in support and <coughs> campaign is one of the most symbolic things that was in Catalonia as well, in, in, in uh, uh, Girona. And uh, also in Catalonia, you're going to be more satisfying when you see things like that. This is a bull ring in, Cat in Barcelona. There were several bull rings, this one that closed a year back, and then they change it into a shopping mall. And now it produces lots of money before it produces nothing, just suffering and blood and, and, and uh, civil, uh, uh, civil unrest, and now produces money and jobs that before didn't do it. So it's economically, it makes perfect sense. Or this is also an interesting case of Caracas, the capital of Venezuela, when it was there a few years back, 2006, that's how the bull ring looked like. So people had known it for a long time. They changed it, they, 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 they refurnished it, the whole thing, but now it's only used for cultural activities that involve no animals whatsoever, for circus without animals activity, for music. So it's a perfect example of an anti bull fighting bull ring. So it's all about against bull fighting. So it's a good advance. We also have bans, local bans, that when countries kind of ban it nationally, perhaps you can ban it locally or either regionally or locally. And this is one, one of the important things that happens. We created the concept of anti-bullfighting town. 
there will be a time to declare itself against all fight when the councils, the, the, the local government officials, they meet, they discuss it, and they say, we're going to ban it in our town, or we're going to make it uh, uh, completely unwelcome, even if we don't have bullfighting in our town. All these is almost 100 municipalities in bullfighting countries that have declared themselves anti-bullfighting. And that's important because then you get the politicians involved. Up to that point, it's only the people now you get the politicians involved. Not surprising either that almost 80% of these are in Catalonia too. So that concept started in Catalonia in 1986, was the first anti-bullfighting town, uh, tossed to the mark, declared in Catalonia, and then started to cut up. And now you see uh, countries here on the right of other countries and they already have it in Latin America. So the concept, the concept was very good, till the point that changed so much the perception of the Catalan people that we managed to ban bullfighting fighting in Catalonia in 2010, as you may know, through the campaign of PRO. After years of trying and changing people's perceptions, we created this campaign. This is called Platform of PRO. PRO, pro means enough in Catalan. Which what we did is, in order to prevent fights between uh, organizations, we created just one new organization that was not an animal protection organization. It was composed or directed by all animal protection groups, not just one all. But in the face of it, it looked like a social movement in which everybody could join, any Catalan could join. And we campaigned through that. We didn't allow any organization, any organization to use their logo. We had some sort of control to prevent that anyone kind of take the credit. And we used what is called an ELD. ILP, which is that Iniciativa Legislativa Popular, which is translated as Popular Legislative Initiative, which is a way to get a bill without the need of an MP to present the bill. In some countries, they have this legal mechanism, mechanism in which if you gather enough signatures in a particular amount of time, the people can present the bill and you don't need an MP to do it for you, which we had tried before, it never worked. And that's what we did. In Catalonia, we needed 50,000 signatures uh, to be achieved in three months we got 180,000 in one month. And we got so many so quickly that the message to the politicians was so strong. And elections were around the corner. They realized, finally, that the penny dropped. We, if we want to win the next election, we have to show to the people that we are with them that we are anti fighting. And that's where the campaign started. It lasted two years. We had to gain uh, three votes. And this is just a video I'm going to show you here of the last vote, which is, uh, this is uh, from the News. The campaign against bull farming in Catalonia began with a petition signed by 180,000 animal protection activists calling for an end to what's known as the Fiesta Nacional. It looks as though the bulls gallop in happily with their necks all decorated. But even before the bullfight, the bull has been stabbed with this here. Animal protectionists are now moving to ban bullfighting in other Spanish regions as well. Catalonia, they say, is just the beginning. But they'll have to persuade a lot of politicians. The political moment of the politician should decide solely as his conscience dictates, not in accordance with his party affiliation. Do they want a Catalonia with more or less cruelty to animals? They ought to decide for less. In modern Catalonia, the interest in the Spanish tradition is weaker than other regions. Here, a bullfighting arena is being converted into a shopping center. Bullfighting opponents are also in the majority inside the Catalonian parliament. Lobbyists of the bullfighting business made a last-ditch effort to influence lawmakers in front of the plenary hall. Comença la votació. The delegates vote by pressing a button. The result is instantly known, an absolute majority for the ban. And I stop here and always gets me that big, because this is what you don't see when you do animal protection very often. You see the politicians turning themselves and applauding the people out there, which is the animal protection organizations. Instead of the politicians saying, yeah, we done it, because I'm a politician, very progressive, and I've been campaigning for yeah, for that. No, they just recognize this is achieved by the public. And it turns themselves and applaud the public, it's basically telling us, without you, we would not make this country better. You allow us to overcome all the difficulties, and we have achieved this by thanks to you. And that's what you need, this battery energy that you need every now and then. See a politician turn into the animal protection as we need you, and without you, we, 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 we will be nothing. And of course, that was a very huge thing. And since then, because the ban was approved in 2010, but initially starts in the 1st of January of 2012. It was a year to sort to, to allow the industry to go away. 
since that moment, so many things have happened, and that was such a, a milestone. For example, Ecuador, there was a referendum, referendum last year that the president asked the people, do you want to ban bull fighting? The people said, yes, we want, so we want referendum there. Mexico City, very soon, very likely, we're going to manage to ban bull fighting in Mexico City, which has the biggest bull ring in the world, and I was in Mexico a few days ago, and we're probably going to get that one. Uh, Colombia, a group of politicians got together to try to become uh, animal protectionists, that never happened before. Peru, they're going to try the same ELP method, and they're in the process of doing that. Venezuela, more anti bull fighting cities being created, all this in this last year. Portugal, also trying to create an ELP. France, is an anti bull fighting bill already in motion. <coughs> And in Galicia, another region of Spain that has the same profile in Catalonia, is possibly the next one. They're going to do the same. They also have two more rings left now. They have many the more anti bull fighting the, uh, cities than anywhere else uh, apart from Catalonia, so it's perfect for, for that. Catalonia, during this year, the, the right wing part countries, uh, political parties, and others have been trying to stop the ban and put obstacles. We had two or three votes, and every vote that we had, uh, either to uh, create a moratorium or, or to stop the money together. We won every vote for more votes than the previous one. So even if we have more support of the politicians now than when we won the, the first vote. And the most important thing of all, if you actually count the number of bulls being tortured in the, in the last few years, if you compare the numbers in 2007 and 2010, a third a fewer num a number of bullfights occur in these years. And our estimations already from the ban of Catalonia to, to this year, in, in Spain, we already estimate that half of the bullfights uh, are, are gone, so therefore uh, each bullfight is six bulls, imagine, so if half of the bullfights are not being made, part of the economic crisis, but part of our pressure, uh, the result is really real, less animal suffering, which is what we always fight for. And that's it, so thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, most people don't know that. Uh, California, the, po the Portuguese uh, population there a few years back, about 30 years ago, started to develop uh, a version of the Portuguese style that you cannot injure the bull because the laws of California don't allow it. So they've changed the last third, and they, instead of uh, using banderillas with the hooks, they use Velcro at the end of it. And everybody thought that would be okay, and they call it bloodless bullfight. An undercover investigation in 2009 showed that in fact there was a spike under the Velcro and they were actually stabbing the bull. It was a big expose. So it's not cruel-less at all. Uh, and, if, and now it's actually growing in other states, in Nevada and in Texas. So it's the only country really where bullfighting is growing. Everywhere else is going out. And it still is that perception that it's not that bad, but it's as bad as anywhere else. Thanks for the question. Thank you for, your, uh, for attending and thank you very much to Jordi for any other positive notes.